Have you ever found an arrowhead? If so, you're luckier than me. If it's not made of wood or bone or metal, all of which would make it a rare find, odds are that it's made of one of two types of rock. Chert or obsidian. A quick look at these rocks and you can tell right away why they were the go-to choices for arrow makers of old. Both of the rocks are very solid and hard, but neither are particularly heavy. They both almost entirely consist of silicon dioxide or silica, the same material that you find in the mineral quartz and in glass. However, silica, unlike pure quartz, is amorphous. It's also very, very brittle. So when chert and obsidian break, they break like glass, and you end up with conchoidally fractured surfaces with very sharp edges, perfect for arrowheads. It's tempting to look at chert and obsidian and say, oh well, they must be the same type of rock. However, you would be dead wrong. Chert is a sedimentary rock. Like other sedimentary rocks, it is primarily found in layers called strata. These strata formed when there was a chemical reaction of fluids, which contained high concentrations of dissolved silica, which precipitated on the seafloor in these layers. Obsidian, on the other hand, is a type of igneous rock a naturally occurring volcanic glass. It forms on the margins of certain lava flows that cool or are quenched very rapidly, such as you might find where hot lava is cooled by ocean water. If the lava contains a high concentration of silica and the lava is cooled quickly enough, then obsidian may form. In this module, I want to give you a short introduction to some common igneous rocks. In historical geology, we tend to focus on sedimentary rocks. They tend to be the most important for studying Earth history because they contain layers dating back to prehistoric times. But there are some real advantages to understanding a bit about igneous rocks. For example, we can use radioisotope dating methods to determine when specific igneous rocks formed. We can use igneous rocks to study how the Earth's magnetic poles and land masses have moved across the planet over time. And we can use igneous rocks that cross cut sedimentary rocks to relatively date sedimentary successions. Of course, these are methods that you will learn at a later date. For now, our focus is igneous rocks. Let's learn some basics. Think back to the rock cycle. You learned that igneous rocks form from the cooling of hot molten fluid called magma. Magma is created from the melting of rock under high temperature and pressure deep in the earth. From there, the magma may migrate up through solid rock. At any point in its journey, the magma may cool and become solid igneous rock. If magma reaches the surface, it will emerge or erupt in a volcano. When magma reaches the surface of the planet through volcanic events, we then call it lava. As lava cools, it turns into what we call an extrusive igneous rock. An extrusive igneous rock is any igneous rock that forms on the surface as opposed to beneath it. Intrusive igneous rocks form in the subsurface of our planet. In these places, for any number of reasons, magma does not reach the surface. It either gets stopped by rocks located above it or it cools too quickly to erupt to make it to the surface as a fluid. The magma may flow through the subsurface and produce any number of intrusive igneous structures. Here, you can see a variety of intrusive structures. 
This is what we call a geologic cross section. It shows the distribution of rocks across the surface of Earth and beneath it. Changes in rocks with depth. Note how the igneous structures cross cut sedimentary rock strata, illustrated in purple, red, green, blue, and yellow. The various igneous intrusive structures form for different reasons, but they all tend to be interrelated. It is sometimes helpful to think of intrusive igneous rocks like they are all part of one big plumbing system, except instead of water, as in your home, this earthbound plumbing system uses magma. Take a closer look. Notice how all the structures are connected, how the dikes and stock branch off the giant batholith. This is because the batholith feeds the others. Batholiths are the largest of the structures. They can reach over 50 miles in diameter. They tend to form deepest in the earth before making their way to the surface. Stocks are similar to batholiths, but much smaller in size. Magmatic dikes are much smaller and more localized than both. They form when magma fills cracks and fractures before cooling and solidifying into igneous rock. Here you can see a small dike in Alaska. With more training and field experience, it will become easier for you to spot intrusive igneous rocks like this one. Let's look again. Notice how dikes feed sills and lacoliths. Structures like sills and lacoliths occur where magma flowed and cooled between layers of rock. From a distance, they may appear like sedimentary strata, but if you look carefully, you will notice that the magma distorted the other layers and the igneous material is very localized. Again, it becomes easier to spot intrusive rocks with more training and experience. Igneous rocks receive different names depending on their composition, appearance, and origin. Indeed, it is helpful to think about some of the most common types of intrusive and extrusive igneous rocks. It is very likely you have heard of basalts and granite. These are names for two different types of igneous rocks. Basalt is an extrusive igneous rock, and granite is an intrusive rock. Basalt is often very easy to identify. Although it can sometimes be somewhat green or red, it is usually black because it contains high concentrations of magnesium and iron. It is a fine grained rock, meaning that it does not contain any large crystals that are discernible to the naked eye. Instead, what you will often see are vesicles, which are small cavities and pits on the surface and inside the rock. These vesicles form when magma contains gas, which create bubbles as the magma cools. When this happens, the rock solidifies around the bubbles, leaving these vesicles in their place. In all these ways, basalts differ dramatically from the other common type of extrusive igneous rock. Rhyolite. Rhyolite also forms from magma that cools on the surface, but it's usually pink or gray in color and it does not contain a lot of vesicles. Rhyolite will often be found with obsidian. Like obsidian, rhyolite is also very rich in silica. Rhyolite and obsidian share their magma with granite. Like rhyolite and obsidian, granite is also rich in silica. This is the reason that so many homeowners invest in granite countertops. Granite is very, very hard. However, unlike rhyolite and obsidian, granite is an intrusive igneous rock. The magma cools in the subsurface, underground. Indeed, it is one of the most common intrusive igneous rocks on our planet, yet another reason people commonly use it for countertops. Granite also differs from rhyolite and obsidian in appearance. Like rhyolite, granite also tends to be pink, white, or gray, 
However, it is a coarse-grained rock. The mineral crystals that make up granite are very easy to see on the surface. It has a very distinctive crystallographic appearance. Some of the most common intrusive igneous rocks are gabbro. Like granite, gabbro is a coarse-grained rock. You can easily see the crystals on the surface. However, it is usually black or dark green and is much more similar to basalt in composition. Like basalt, gabbro contains high concentrations of iron and magnesium. Indeed, basalt and gabbro come from virtually the same magma. Why do the differences among these igneous rocks exist? Why are some coarse grained while others are fine grained? Why are some pink while others are black? The answers to these questions are related to the compositions of the magmas that produce the rocks, as well as the way they form. Let's start with crystal size. Crystal size is related to how quickly a magma cools. You probably noticed that the intrusive rocks that we've discussed, granite and gabbro, are both coarse grained and have very large conspicuous crystals, which you can see with the unaided eye. Basalt and rhyolite, the extrusive rocks on the other hand, are fine grained. This is no coincidence. When magma is underground, it is insulated and it loses very little heat over time. For this reason, it cools very slowly and it solidifies very slowly. This means that an intrusive rock takes a long time to form. Under these conditions, the crystals of an intrusive rock have ample time to grow large enough to be seen with the naked eye. In contrast, magma that erupts to the surface cools much quicker, particularly if it comes into contact with water like the ocean. Its crystals have no time to grow. For this reason, extrusive igneous rocks tend to be fine-grained. The other important factor that explains the differences between these igneous rocks and their appearance is the chemical compositions of the magmas and lavas that produce them. This is an intimidating but very useful graph for understanding igneous rock chemistry. It illustrates the percentages of minerals in different igneous rocks. As you can plainly see, there's a huge difference between the intrusive rocks granite and gabbro and between the extrusive rocks rhyolite and basalt. Granite and rhyolite are located on the left side of the graph. Granite and rhyolite are what we call felsic rocks. They contain very high concentrations of silica along with the light elements like sodium and potassium. These elements occur in the minerals quartz and in various feldspar minerals. Gabbro and basalt are what we call mafic rocks. They occur on the right side of this graph. They consist of heavier elements like iron and magnesium. These elements occur in minerals such as pyroxene, olivine, and plagioclase feldspar. There are other types of igneous rocks too, diorite and andesite for example, which fall between felsic and mafic rocks in composition. There are also ultramafic rocks, which contain even higher concentrations of iron and magnesium, like peridotite. For now, let's focus on felsic and mafic igneous rocks. Why do these differences exist? Why do some rocks contain high concentrations of silicon and oxygen, while others favor magnesium and iron? Think back to the beginning. You've learned that igneous rocks form from the cooling of magma. If two igneous rocks differ, it's because their magmas had different origins. The Earth formed from material left over from the creation of our Sun. 
This space dust orbited the sun just as the planets do today. And over the course of geologic time, the dust began to collide, aggregate, and coalesce under the influence of gravity. Under these conditions, where there are many high pressure collisions, the dust began to heat up and from it emerged a proto-Earth like planet. When the Earth first formed, it was a hot molten mass of material. As the molten material began to cool, heavy elements like iron and nickel sank under the influence of gravity to the center of the planet. Lighter elements like silicon and sodium and potassium and oxygen were displaced to the surface of the planet where they now occur in the quartz and feldspar minerals of the crust. In this context, it is likely that events that happened on Earth billions of years ago still affect the chemical composition of magma today. I think that's pretty cool. How about you? At the very least, these events may help to explain why so many people make their arrowheads out of obsidian.